This is Tommy's Outdoors 101. Folks, those of you who follow me on social media know that I read and was quite impressed by the book by Mary Caldwell called Beak, Tooth and Claw. Uh, a book uh, deals with a uh, difficult topic of coexistence with predators. Uh, I even wrote a blog, uh, a book review. Uh, you can find that blog on tommysoutdoors.com. And in that blog, I said that I would really love to talk with Mary uh, if and when the opportunity arises and talk with her about the book and about those uh, difficult, uh, this difficult subject of coexistence with predators. And folks, this day is today. Our guest, uh, mine and your, yours, is Mary Caldwell. And we indeed talk about the book, talk about existence with predators and many other subjects. Um, Mary is a, a environmentalist, freelance producer, and author. And um, obviously, Mary is best known for her work on uh, curlew conservation. Uh, for those of you who don't know, curlew is a, a, a biggest wader um, and uh, the bird, and its population declined rapidly. It just it just plummeted, and Mary is working ty tirelessly. Uh, to raise awareness and um, support uh, conservation of this beautiful bird. So in the first part of the podcast, we talked about the book, we talked about coexistence with predators, and then kind of in the, in the second part of the podcast, we drifted away into discussion about curlew, specifically what is the current status, how we get here where we are, and um, what are the efforts uh, at the moment to support and conserve Curlew and what you can do if you want to uh, support that work. So um, a very interesting episode and I'm really glad and, and big thank you to, to Mary to, uh, for, for finding time to talking with me. And uh, as usual, before I let you enjoy this episode of the podcast, if you want to support the podcast and what I do, please share Tommy's Outdoors, tommysoutdoors.com with your friends or with anyone who you think might be interested in the subjects we're discussing here. Share the podcast or share the specific episodes. And this is great help for me and for the podcast. And if you want to go an extra mile, please uh, leave a rating, leave the comment, five-star rating, uh, thumbs up, um, write a review. It all depends where you listen or where you watch the podcast. Uh, but regardless, any of these sort of... Uh, interactions this is great help for me and for the podcast so this is the best thing you can do if you want to support me and ultimately give me more energy to do more episodes in the future and so now ladies and gentlemen without any further ado beak tooth and claw with mary caldwell Mary, welcome to Tommy's Outdoors. Thanks, thanks for doing this, and I appreciate it. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for asking me. <laughs> yes. Um, listen, I read your, I follow your for for a while, and and your work. But recently, you you wrote a book, uh, Big Tooth and Claw: Living with Predators in Britain. And I, you know, I think that at that point everybody knows about the book, and if you, if anyone doesn't they go and 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 read and read the book and get the book but the, the, i suppose the first question i have is you're known at least in my head as a curlew lady so what makes you to write a book about predators because the future of curlew of, uh, the future of all ground nesting birds tommy is um in the hands of predators, if you like, predators and farming. They're the two things that are impacting on ground nesting birds. So uh, when I found out more and more about curlews, I did this big walk from the west coast of Ireland right the way through to the east coast of England um, and passed through all kinds of, of landscapes, trying to find out why the Eurasian curlew was doing so badly in the UK. <clears throat> and, you know, everywhere it was the two main issues. The way we use the land, be that farming or forestry or peat extraction or whatever, and um, the high numbers of predators that we have in the in the UK. Um, 
And unless we get to grips with how to live alongside predators, um, why we have so many and what our relationship needs to be with them, um, I fear that we're going to have a very unbalanced system and birds like curlews are going to disappear from large areas. Now, the reason we have high numbers of predators in the UK is not really understood. And so I wouldn't like to give the impression that everybody knows what the problems are. We don't. But there's some theories. And the theories are that in these highly, sorry, I'm going to, highly intensive landscapes that we have, I'm just going to put my new do not disturb on, I'm sorry. Um, highly, uh, um, highly disturbed landscapes we have, the very intensive farming how, how much food we grow, how we become big monocultures, big urban centers with lots of rubbish in them, really does seem to favor what we call generalist predators, like foxes and crows and so on. Um, and it doesn't favor those birds that need more nuance in the landscape, that are more specialist. So we are generating or supporting large numbers of generalist predators at the expense of our more, um, specific wildlife and that creates an imbalance and then when the generalist predators eat that specialist wildlife then you get into real problems and that's why I wrote the book um, because there, we do have an issue um, it's not a book about uh, not against predators predators are you know wonderful meso predators are wonderful creatures uh, just an essential part of British wildlife what I'm questioning is how do we live with the imbalance Yes. You know, and why I was reading the book, what was something I probably loved the most about the book is that you're, you, you, you did not jump to conclusions. And, and by the way, that was, that was probably one of the criticism, like, oh, there is no conclusion of the book, right? I personally loved it because I, I even have in my head a few projects that I might eventually get to uh, kind of concluding where I think this is the greatest thing ever to present the points of view, present different points of view and don't jump to the conclusion and leave the viewers or listeners or, or readers with, you know, here's the evidence, make up your own mind, especially with such a complex subject. So I, I wonder whether you set out with this idea, I'm not going to jump to a conclusion, I'm just going to present the, the evidence or as you research the book, it kind of happened naturally that you go like, well, there's no way I can, I can, you know, put a finger on it. Like, this is a problem. So was it, was it, did you meant to do that that way? Or is it just happens as you were researching and writing the book? It was probably a mixture of both, but um, very much my take is that, you know, we're intelligent people uh, presented with um, the facts, then we can make up our own minds. And really there are so many people telling us what to think. There are a lot of people, particularly in conservation, who want to tell you what to think. And I like to think people can make up their own minds, to be honest. And we all come to at life from very different backgrounds and understandings and cultures. And I want people to just, if they read my book, to, to see that there are these different viewpoints of the world out there. And where do you think fits? What do you agree with? you know, what would you think is the most important thing? It's not for me to tell you, it, that's not my job, you know, and as you say, the more you get into it, the more complex and convoluted it is. And I'm not even sure I know myself sometimes what I actually think it can shift. So, um, but I do think uh, the, 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 the number of people out there that want to tell you is very large. And there's very few people like me saying, what do you think? You know, you, you've now come, come with me across Britain. You've talked to these very different people. You've seen the humanity behind the conflict. What do you think? You know, and, and I think that's more powerful because it's too easy. It is too easy to be told what to do. And it is too easy to get people worked up and frenzied and angry and full of hate. And that's not difficult. You know, you and I could do that within seconds. But that's not the right thing to do. The right thing to do and the lasting thing to do is to get people to come to a conclusion that comes from within themselves. And then it's lasting. Mm. You know, 
being told doesn't last. Yeah. Anybody who's had kids knows that. <laughs> <laughs> true. That's very true. That's very true. And, 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 and you're right. There's especially looking at the world from through the lens of social media, it's, it's almost like there's a lot of people who are just, just, all right, just tell me what it is. Just tell me what to think. Right. Because it's, it's, it, it, and we don't have, don't want to do the hard work. It's like, well, look at this. This is, the, this is what happened. This is what happens. Like, no, 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 just, just tell me what to think. And then you have, like, like, you, like you said, is, almost people just bunching together in those groups and they're just bashing each other. And this is no way we're going to move forward, right? And it's not, it's not only we won't move forward, it might even move backwards. Um, because what you do is when you, what you end up with is people yelling at each other. I mean, literally yelling with hardening attitudes. And so that doesn't even, they don't, those things don't even meet and merge in the middle. They just shoot past each other, those attitudes and that the ground between them gets wider and the, you know there's a hardening of approaches and I, I can't think of any other any example in politics history where it has won to shout at another person or to dominate them that isn't just a dictatorship and, and if we want to if we're serious about living in community then you are duty bound to listen to other people and you're duty bound to consider their point of view. Now you may not agree with it and you may have very strong feelings against it. And I certainly do, but that doesn't mean to say I have to yell at them and say, well, it's my way or the highway. What you say is, okay, we fundamentally disagree on X, but there are other things we do agree on. So let's actually concentrate on those at the moment and let's see how close together we can come, you know, because I reckon a lot of the time we're closer together than we actually admit. I, I just love what you said, because this is what I'm, I, I always say, like, let's, let's work on things that we agree on. And once we get there, then we can discuss what we disagree on. And while we work, well, we're working on stuff that we agree on, we get to know each other better we get to understand each other better. And then we are in so much better position to actually deal with what we disagree on rather than let's jump straight into why I hate you, why you hate me and, and deal with that and, and think like, like, was that disappointing? Was it kind of for you disappointing or, or you know, you wrote this book and hope, you, you surely hope to open a discussion, open a better understanding was it disappointing that you you maybe this question like how how much you feel you achieved that goal to get people talking? I think I really have achieved it. There are, uh, a, I mean, as you well know, there was um, a very hostile review of it from a conservationist and um, who actually, uh, you know, to give him his due, Mark has done a huge amount of, of really good stuff and been you know, really fighting for the cause of hen harriers for a long time. And it is a bitter, nasty area to get into. So I can understand his frustration when someone says, hang on a minute, let's talk about this, because he's done with talking about it. But actually, I haven't done with talking about it. And I defend my right to say I haven't done with talking about this. And I think we have ground to make, you know. So I was disappointed with that. But what I was really uh, pleased about was the number of emails and comments on social media, different ways of communicating to me. And a lot of people said, your books really made me think, your books actually made me question stuff that I just didn't question before. Now that meant more to me than anything. Uh, I've had gamekeepers write to me saying, you know, I wasn't expecting to like this, but actually, you know, all right, I didn't agree with all of it, but I can see what you mean. And other people saying, isn't it good that I think it's really useful to see the world the way other people see us? You know, I didn't realize people thought that about us. Or, and so I think it has got people talking and, um, and I'm delighted about that. And I hope it just continues to keep the conversation going because we cannot stay in a situation where it's just anger. That has never worked. Yeah, I, 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 I understand and I agree with you. And this is you know what I what I 
I won't say often, but this is I'm aware of with even with my podcast with a variety of guests I have. I I I, I had a comments like, oh, how can you have this and that person on the podcast, or uh, you know, this guy and this and this, you know, this and that, like, and this is reflecting badly on you, right? And it's like, how is it reflecting badly on me that I talk to people, right? It's, it's like I, I talk with anyone who is reasonable and want to present its case. I I'm happy to, to give my platform and and talk about it. So. I understand. I agree with you completely. Um, Mary, tell me the whole process of research for the book. How, how does that look like? How do you approach that, that research and how, and maybe how long it took? To, to... Yeah, it took um, quite a while, um, a year or two, a year and a half, maybe. Um, the process is just to say, well, this is, the, I want to talk about uh, foxes. So I want to talk to people who um, find them a problem, uh, like sheep farmers or gamekeepers um, who are trying to protect ground nesting birds. I want to go and talk to those people whose world says foxes are a real pain in the ass for me. And I don't want them in. I don't mind them outside my territory. I don't want them in my territory because they give me too many problems. And I wanted to know what that what that felt like to be in their shoes for a day or so. Uh, but I also wanted to talk to people who have that very uh, sensitive and um, I can't quite get the right word, but just love foxes for what they bring to our lives. And that's very often urban people. You know, I live right in the center of a city and Tommy and, and I, I literally live next to a bus station. You know, you couldn't be more city center than I am. And I was watching a fox early this morning, just trotting down the street and it is that glimpse of the wild in a very urban setting. And people love that. And, uh, and that's a very important function as well. Other people who just love foxes, just, they just love what they represent and how they look and how they act. And those are two very different sets of people, usually. Um, and so it's important to go and spend time with them, just to talk, to see, to understand, and then just to present it. Look, I found this and I also found this. Um, and these are the facts about what foxes are doing out in the countryside. And these are the facts about how far they range, how many we've got and so on. So what are we going to do? How are we going to live with these wonderful animals? How are we going to do it? What's your ideas? You know? And is it is it like started with foxes and then you progress to every other a predator because you even get into and uh, you're talking about seals and and birds and everything else or did you had a like right right from the get-go idea that i'm gonna go through every single one of those i just picked the ones that were the most problematic the ones that caused the most conflict um i mean there's lots and lots i didn't cover um so i just went for the headliners really uh, the corvid seals um foxes um, birds of prey, and um, and then looked at future uh, uh, creatures that we might reintroduce back into the country. The big, the big carnivores like lynx and wolves and so on. So if we think, oh, goodness, you know, if we can't live with a fox, we <laughs> don't know what we're going to do about a wolf. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, and so those are the re they were really interesting questions to me because it's not just about the practicalities. Um, having these creatures back in, in our lives is not just about how many sheep will they eat? It's about what does it do to us as people? What does that glimpse of some extraordinarily large wild creature do to our psyche, our society? I mean, we become very removed from that frisson of living with a big dangerous animal. Um, and I think in many ways we, we, we've suffered from that, our imaginations have suffered from that. So to bring them back, wow, you know. But then the interesting question, if we bring them back and they do well, we're going to have to decide what we're going to do about that. You yes. know? So a pack of wolves up in Sutherland in the north of Scotland is one thing. A pack of wolves outside Reading is another. And so what are we, how are we going to react to the fact that we're going to need to control these creatures if they do do very well? And I don't think that we've had those conversations enough yet. It's all about, wouldn't it be wonderful to have wolves back and won't they be a nice controlling factor? But I think there's, there's a lot more psychology to it than that. Oh, yeah. And there is a lot of, a lot of uh, social conflict that, that then this is causing again. I remember talking with um, a hunter from Sweden where they have uh, wolves and they have a control measures and how much conflict 
around, you know, having to control these. And this is something that I said, I, for me, this is probably the biggest argument against introducing, and don't get me wrong, I would love to have wolves in Ireland and, and UK. That would be absolutely awesome. Mm-hmm. But the, the, the chief argument for me against that introduction, at least against that inclusion right now, is not so much that they're going to eat sheep. It's because so amount of social conflict and, and division that is going to create. And, and like you said, there's other, other things that we probably could work in the meantime, rather than, you know, fight over whether we need to shoot wolves or catch them and export them somewhere or, or, or anything like that. Um, while I was reading your book, and so when I was reading your book, certain things were kind of coming back to me, something that I, that I noticed, and you kind of put it like right black and white in front of me. And one of those is the research or a lack of it. It's, it, it are you frustrated about, maybe frustration is the wrong word, but it, it seems like we, we missing hard evidence and data a lot because there's not enough research. And, and, I, and I had this discussion with when it comes, for example, to foxes, where let, let's lose the example of foxes. You talk about to, to one group of people and say, oh, the population of foxes decline, you know, 40, 60, whatever percent. And then you talk about to another group of people and it's like, oh, it's impossible to get rid of all the foxes. They're everywhere. And right. And, and I'm an engineer by trade, right? It's like, what is that? Like, what is the data says? How many foxes do we have? And it turns like nobody knows. <laughs> no, no, nobody ever done the research or, or like, it's, it's frustrating, right? It's really frustrating. And that's why a lot of the conflict arises because there are these very different data sets out there. And so you can pick and choose your data to, to do whatever. And one of the criticisms of the book was, oh, you used the wrong data. You know, you didn't use my data, you used their data. And that was very telling to me because um, nobody knows. You know, we haven't put enough effort into understanding these creatures yet. We don't know. They're difficult to study anyway, um, and the, 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 the amount of time and money that we need to put in to really getting to understand them just isn't, isn't materialising at the moment. And so what, there's a lot of hearsay. There's a lot of people that say, well, I know it's the case. I, I highlighted it with farmers. You know, they definitely take lambs. Seagulls take lambs. Foxes take lambs. Badgers take lambs, you know. Um, but actually seeing the predation events is not this is very rare seeing the aftermath a dead lamb and a fox wandering around or lamb bones in, a, in an eagle's nest is not the same as a predation event and yet somehow it all gets put together so the data is scarce because the data is hard to get but if we're going to sort this out and we i do think we're going to struggle to introduce bigger creatures back into the landscape if we don't get these two communities or a number of communities that really oppose each other talking from the same page, you know, because unless we agree that there's a lot of foxes and probably we should reduce the number down if we're going to have a healthy diversity, unless we, 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 we can look at the figures and say that data is sound, this is what we need to do. I don't know we'll ever agree on that. Um, and if, and, but if we do agree on that, if we can agree on foxes or badgers or, or sea eagles, then we've got a much better chance of agreeing on wolves and lynx. But at the moment, the communities are so divided, they'll just, everybody will find a reason not to do it. Mm-hmm. I, I almost wonder when, you know, where, where people or conservationists or activists, they're raising money. Why, and I have that like a similar thread recently, like why nobody raises money to fund a research let's let's not you know that's that was like let's fund the research let's raise a bunch of money and put it into scientific institutions the university and fund researchers for three years straight do the research is it like also kind of hesitance on the you feel like is it a hesitance in the scientific circles as well like oh i better not go there or like like oh what happened if I finance that research and they're going to find something I don't like? Do you feel there is a, that, that element of, of hesitation of getting 
actual data because that might prove something that I don't like? I'm not sure, to be honest. I think scientists are very good at being scientists. So um, I think it's whether the question is pertinent or not to them. And um, I think there's a, from, from my perspective in the work I do with ground nesting birds, there is a real desire now to work out because we're at such a crisis point. Um, we are seriously looking at extinction in large parts of the country, regional extinctions. So there is, a, there is an increasing desire to work out what, what is going on. So maybe there just wasn't that urgency a while ago, but there, there's growing stuff now. So I probably wouldn't say it's that. I'd say it's more, um, it's got more currency now than it did before. Uh -huh. That's good to hear. Okay. I'd like to switch gears a little bit and ask you about like a, like an open discussion on a few, few points. And one of those points is related to the dirty R words, rewilding, right? There's one of those things you say rewilding and people are like, Oh my God, like, <laughs> without even like, you made a very interesting point that, that again, Um, I, I don't mind to, sh you know, I don't mean to shine my own wheels, but this is something I was, I was saying all along. And you made that point specifically in the book that if you talk about reintroduction of species of that compensation, not necessarily will cut it, right? Like, because you, you hear like, oh, we should reintroduce wolves and we should have sufficient compensations, right? And the farmer then thinks like, oh my God, there's like a ton of paperwork, Right. But then there's also that element that people are emotionally connect connected with with their animals. Yeah. And and in that case, that like, all right, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna pay you for this cow or this horse or this sheep, right? And then it's like, well, it, it, you should look at it, or or listeners, I'm, I know I'm not talking to you, but like at least you should look at it from the perspective of your dog. You have your dog, which is like family member. And the dog gets killed, and then some, you know, a, uh, you know, some bureaucrat shows up at your door. It's like, oh, here's just like two thousand for the dog. Thank you, right? It just doesn't work that way. Yeah, I think a sheep farmer very strongly made that that point, didn't he? That um, that it isn't actually just about money. It is far more about everything you put in to making your farm work. And then suddenly there's this extra factor comes in, which is an extra predator and, and creates yet another problem for you to deal with, which is both an emotional one and a financial one. And life is hard enough for farmers. And, you know, I just don't want to, I'm sorry, there's a helicopter. There's a, <laughs> that's oh, right. That's right. Um, and so it is, a, it, I think the emotional attachment to livestock and actually to a way of life that, 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 that surrounds that it has to be a factor that's played in and we, we saw that when we had a terrible outbreak of, of foot and mouth in this country you know there was a lot of farmers had to destroy all their flocks and so on it was a really traumatic thing not just because oh my goodness I've got to buy a lot of new livestock this is my life that's being destroyed now I don't think for one minute introducing something like a wolf will have that effect on farmers. I don't think it is, but uh, I mean, they won't take that many, I'm sure. Um, but the point is, it's a big emotional, practical uh, step that you're asking people to take without really understanding what that means to them. I think there's, I think we have a long way to go. And we found that with sea eagles, you know, the farm. Sea eagles don't take many lambs. They just don't. You know, you lose far, far, far more lambs to starvation and, and hypothermia and disease. But that's not the point. The point is they felt these things have been foisted on them. Don't want them. Where have they come from? Why are they in my life? You know, I could do without this. And my life's tough enough anyway. So there's all that stuff that we need to talk about, develop, have much deeper conversations with them. And, and I'm not teaching people to suck eggs. I think this is well known, but I don't think necessarily the wider public think about it. And it was certainly really interesting for me to come across that. So it's not just, conservation is not about animals. Conservation is about people. It's about how people think, what they want, what they'll tolerate, what their vision is, what they want to protect. That's what conservation is about. The creatures will take care of themselves, you know, if we allow them. But 
they have to fit into a matrix of human emotions and desires and needs. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good moment to talk about like two models of whether you know conservation or rewilding. And and I'm very curious about your opinion on it because I how I see this is like okay, two different models. One is so-called fortress conservation, right? We have an area of the land that nobody wants. We put a fence around that and there is the wilderness. So if you want to go to the wilderness, you park your car in front of it and you go into the wilderness and then you're back to your, right? And then there's another model that says like, oh, we need to rewild people. We need to learn to live with the animals and, and so and so on. Uh, what do you think, like, which one is more practical? Which one is that one that we more likely w will get in the future? I think there's absolutely no doubt that we'll need to do both of those at the same time. I think we will have to partition some areas for wildlife simply because they need too much space and too much wild out there to survive. And if we want them, we'll have to give them that space. But you can't rely just on those fenced off areas because all they do then is become sinks, what's called ecological sinks. So creatures just end up being in them and um, devoid from outside. And then there's, you've got a massive problem inside, you know, with lots of, it's like a, a boiling point, <laughs> sort of bubbling pot of all sorts of things going on in these sinks um, that they come into. But we will probably need protected areas. Um, but there is just no doubt, we have to connect the wider community, our wider society to the natural world again, so that we feel comfortable living in it that we don't feel scared or worried because you see something, that you understand it, you understand how it fits into your life, how it fits into the natural world around you and how that natural world around you fits into a wider landscape. We, we've lost that intuitive, everyday conversation with nature. We've become urbanites, we've become nice and settled and removed from the natural world, and we've got to start to educate ourselves again. Otherwise, Otherwise, it will be too difficult to tie all these ends up. And one of the, the, one of the interesting things is in our heads, a lot of people say, oh, let's rewild Britain. Let's, you know, look at NEP. And NEP estate is the, the big farm in Sussex that's been allowed to sort of develop and become quite, do what it wants to do, in other words, with some management, but uh, it is a sort of rewilding project. But NEP can't be... Uh, what the country looks like. The country can't look like NEP, you know, because we live here, we need food, we need people to grow food, we need infrastructure, we need roads, we need blah, blah. Um, and so NEP doesn't ask society to change at all, as it is in a contained area. It's just a little vision of loveliness, if you like. What we have to do is fit into a much more messy compromise with wildlife all over the place and that will vary in intensity as to where we are but we're at such a low level we've got to reach everybody to get up a level in terms of our nature literacy is a way of putting it and then that will vary and and there'll be really protected areas but there'll be areas where we try and live together a lot better we many more what you know green areas and cities much more sympathetic nature farming but it won't be rewilding as in letting everything go we can't do that everywhere yeah and and i guess on 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 this front you're you're also quite active into in the idea of uh, education and putting na natural history into the curriculum for for a was it was it middle school was it yes yeah, 16 year olds a gcse it's the exams that 16 year olds take mm -hmm. yeah that that's that i think that's a fantastic idea because like you said we we become so soft. I, I, I mean, it might be sound sound bad, but it's like you know, people go on a path and they twist their ankle, and they next thing they do, they they're gonna sue something, farmer or somebody, because you twist like seriously, you just twist your ankle, right? And and so then when you try to put that against, like oh, you have an an animal and predator, a bear that can actually maul you all, like how is that gonna work? And without this willingness. It's just, it's just super hard. It's super know. hard if you don't 
if you if you don't understand the nature around you if it's just a sort of a bit alien a bit scary full of things that bite and sting you know mm. should we just get rid of it and should we just put down some plastic grass instead you know <laughs> like my neighbor over there like when i'm pointing my finger now like just put his entire yard in plastic grass i look it's like dude uh, Know. he needs to do what she needs to do with GCSE and natural history and just and and if you do it's not it's not just about that it's about saying you know we've lost a lot of enchantment and anybody who studies nature you suddenly find you're living in a world of wonder a world of, of fascination of intricacy of surprise of beauty of sort of horror you know it challenges you on every single level And what a shame, what a pity that our young people are not looking at, you know, the so-called weeds that grow down the streets and think, wow, look, you know, I understand what that plant does, how much other insects depend on it, how it produces pollen, how it attracts insects in, you know, um, how does it survive? How does it spread? You know, there's just so many fascinating questions um, when you see bees and hoverflies and butterflies you know that each one of those creatures has has lives which you know you the best science fiction writer couldn't come up with and we've lost that ability to go wow wow to the most common things around us and and to be honest that was my motivation for the GCSE to re-engage us with wonder again I think that's the best way to do it because education is a paramount. I always say that, you know, we can have a, some short-term measures, but the long-term, like the most powerful long-term measure is education and educating people from, so so we're not withdrawing into the virtual world, right? Because we withdraw into virtual world more and more. And like you have your wow when you have your next phone with the some super fast chip and it's like wow like oh god two years time it's gonna be like rubbish like <laughs> what yeah. you're what you're excited about <laughs> yeah. yeah um this is mary so and next thing I, i'd like to kind of chat with you about is what are your views on so-called putting wildlife into democratic vote right because there are i, I had these conversations as well that on, on some level you would think that if you decided to have a vote on you know reintroduction of links or wolves or some policy let's say um i feel like a tide is turning and more people start to be aware about you know biodiversity crisis climate crisis about all those things and they might you know, go and vote, especially portion of the society that will not be directly affected. Like, oh, great, let's have a walls everywhere, right? And the farmer need to just deal with it. We need, we need this natural heritage, right? So that might be something that, will, that would move the agenda. On the other hand, even conservationists are often against this sort of actions and i think it was in colorado recently where they voted to introduce wolves and and even people involved in wolf conservation like no 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 it's much better if they will migrate naturally because those wolves will have certain qualities that will make them to get in a conflict with people less rather than we bring them in the containers and cut them loose in there so what's your what's your view on that I think um, I, I think that's a really complicated question, and I refer back to the book again. Um, when I talked to a, uh, somebody who helped reintroduce red kites back into the country, uh, the story of red kites is they were per persecuted to extinction in England, and down to just a tiny handful of pairs in Wales. And this guy Tony Cross helped um, build the Welsh population back up but it was a very slow going, there was still a lot of persecution. They don't, you know, it was, it was just an effort. And, um, and meanwhile, England wanted them back. So then we went and got kites from abroad, uh, Spain and bought them in and reintroduced them. And the same species, the same bird, but they were brought back in and they did very well in England and they took off in, in Wales eventually. And now there's red kites in many, many areas. But his, his observations were interesting. He said it was really hard getting Wales, the Welsh population to grow, but he said, with hindsight, I wish we'd just 
waited. We'd kept going, we'd waited so that the red kites naturally colonized England again, because then you don't get what you do sometimes here. These things are foreign, they shouldn't be here. They've just been imposed from outside. You know, if you let things come back naturally, then they, like the buzzard has in many areas, you just get used to it. And whereas if it's a reintroduction, it can bring with it, um, no, well, nobody asks me, I don't want them, you know, it's too much of a, a difficult thing. And as I said, it, it, without the education and the understanding of the history behind the creatures and why they've gone in the first place and how they actually do fit into the landscape, what and being realistic about what they can, the damage, in inverted commas, they can do to livestock and crops and so on, and be realistic about that, not pretend they don't do things, because these are these are predators, you know, they will eat things. Um, then people don't feel hoodwinked, they don't feel like they've been led up the garden path, they feel like everything's been honest. So I, I think it's a complicated question. I think there's lots of things going on which... Um, where people want a, a rewilded Britain. All of us want more wildlife in Britain, all of us. How we get there, we haven't quite decided. And whose voices are we going to listen to above others, we haven't quite decided. And that's where conflict arises, which is why it's so hard to say, this is the way to think and we're going to do this. I, I find it very difficult to, to say that. Mm. It's, because it's, democracy isn't like that. Democracy in community is complex. Yes, true. That's probably the the biggest in the uh, issue in in Britain in in Ireland that we are on the island, and like in in Europe, like is that wolves, or whether it's wolves or lynx or boar or or even um, jackals, they're just colonizing. They're naturally moving in and out and. Then, like you said, why? Well, I guess now we have this animal here. While it, it, when you live on the island, is everything becomes political, because someone needs to get permission from somebody and actually bring the animals in the crates, right? And that is like a human aspect. It has nothing to do with wildlife. It's nothing to do with the habitat. It's like, who gave you permission and why? And like, why you gave him? This is a, this is a massive problem. Yeah, this is why conservation and environmental issues are all about people, not the creatures themselves. And I think that's a bit of a misnomer. Let's let nature do what nature wants to do. But nature can't do what it wants to do because, <clears throat> because we're in the mix as well. And so... And that's when politics and and community become the most important things as to whether something's going to survive in this country or not. Yeah, true. Okay, let's uh, let's switch the gears a little bit and let's talk about curlew. We cannot not talk about curlew, right? We of just course. have we just have to we just have to. <laughs> Can you lay out for? Yes, there you go, there you go. <laughs> very good, very good. Um, how could you just for? People, because I presume there's a certain number of people who would listen to that and they don't know the problem. Can you just briefly give us a history like about the curlew, how it happened that it was, you know, it was so popular. It was like, a, you know, 5,000 breeding pairs. It was all fine. And then in a, you know, shockingly short time span, the population just collapsed. Okay. So the, the curlew, for those who don't know, the Eurasian curlew is Britain's largest wading bird. And it's, um, I would say, if you think of a herring gull or a, you know, a duck or something with long legs, it's that sort of size, um, with a very long downward curving bill. And it has the most haunting and beautiful call. And um, traditionally, they're birds of upland areas. So they, as far as we know, pretty much were confined to rough grassland and moorland in the uplands, in open landscapes, not forests, but open landscapes. Um, and they did quite well up there. And as far as you know, that's where they were. Then in the, about the middle to the end of the 19th century, probably coinciding with an increase in game shooting up in the uplands, where there was habitat management and big amounts of predators removed, lots and lots of ground nesting birds um, did very well. And the curlew seemed to have been a beneficiary. Seemed, this is only theory, this is not proved. And they spread out. 
And um, for the first time, we find them nesting in farmland and lowland areas. And uh, right up until the sort of 60s and 70s, they did very, very well in lowland areas of Britain. Um, they loved the sort of slow paced farming life of late cutting of hay, lots of insects, lots of damp, insect rich meadows. Um, and uh, farmers then, you know, kept a few foxes down. They, you know, there was just a general sort of different, slower paced um, farming lifestyle. But then things changed. There was a, a, in the 80s onwards, late 70s, 80s onwards, intensification hit farming. There was a drive to produce a lot more food, came out of the sort of Second World War and the worry about not being able to feed ourselves. Farms stopped being little old McDonald type farms with a few, you know, rotation of crops and animals. They became agricultural units, specializing in just sugar beet or just cows or, you know, just sheep. And they became bigger, specialized, intensive. The landscapes changed, everything altered. Um, and suddenly the curlew and the other ground nest or the farmland birds found that their habitats had become uniform and difficult to operate in. There was no longer this higgledy-piggledy, uh, you know, varied landscape for them to live in. It all became very similar. We started feeding our cattle, uh, beef and dairy cattle silage through the winter months, which meant growing grass um, quickly and in large, lots of quantity. So we start cutting for silage can be as late as April, you know, early as late April, multiple times a year. Um, ground nesting birds just can't survive in that. And as we said right at the beginning of the podcast, these intensive landscapes and big urban centres, certain creatures like foxes and crows, corvids, gulls, whatever, do very well in those. Um, and so the ground nesting birds fell foul of a change in habitat and an increase in predators. And that's why from the 80s onwards, we've seen quite dramatic declines. So much so that in 2015, um, a, a seminal paper came out in British Birds that said the UK now needs to consider the curlew as the greatest conservation priority for birds. We've seen a 97%, can I say that again? 97% decline in the numbers of breeding pairs of curlew in Southern Ireland. So Southern Ireland used to have five, 8,000 breeding pairs. I don't think anybody really knew thousands of breeding pairs. The last count is 135 breeding pairs. Wales, um, literally in a call this morning, probably down to 450 breeding pairs across the whole of the country of Wales. And uh, Southern England, below Birmingham, if you like, maybe 500. So we have got, on the whole, 2,000-ish breeding pairs of curlews in all of Ireland and Southern England. And uh, which means that there are a lot more in the uplands and the, uh, in their traditional strongholds. But even there, we're seeing sustained declines every year by year. And so we've seen overall a 50, over 50% 50 decline overall across the United Kingdom in 20 years. And that's relentlessly going down. There's no indication that that decline is, is, is bottoming out. And that's why I became really interested in them. Not only are they beautiful, enigmatic, wonderful bird with this gorgeous song, a symbol of sort of wild spirit, if you like. Um, they're that, but they're also the, the signature for what we're doing to landscapes. So we're going to lose a bird. We're going to lose beauty in our lives. And we're going to use a bird which is an indicator of the health. I mean, we cannot hold our heads up as a nation that cares about our natural heritage and just watch a bird like the curlew disappear under our nose. We just can't do it. I, I, well, not on my watch anyway. And I'll do everything that I can to keep it hanging on and to reverse that decline. Mm. Is, is, the, is the curlew, is it the farmland bird? I mean, like what they were doing before farmland. Well, that we've all had farmland for an awful long time. So. Yeah, but uh, I mean, like, 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 if it's if it, like it's a wading bird, you you'd not immediately think farm or upland. No, you don't. No, it's true. It's it's a bird that likes open landscapes to breed, and it actually doesn't really mind what that open landscape is, as long as it's 
Um, it's got longish gra grass to put its nest in, shorter grass to feed its chicks in, and it can, on the whole, get a, a couple of chicks away every couple of years. You know, it doesn't need a massive breeding productivity. It's used to uh, high levels of losses. It's a long-lived bird. The longest curlew, longest-lived bird that we've that's been found has been 32. Huh. So for th it can breed for 30 years uh, that we know. So it, it's got lots of chances to produce young. So it doesn't need to produce billions of curlews every year just to keep a stable population. I think that about one chick every other year would do it. But um, they're not even getting close to that. So it's a bird of open landscapes, whether that be in the uplands or in farmland. But it does need a set of criteria, uh, which is vegetation, insects, dampness to survive and, 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 and a relatively copable with level of predation. Mm. And, and what are the biggest like projects or efforts going on right now to reverse uh, the decline? I'm so pleased, Tommy, that there are quite a few. It's early days yet. But there's quite a lot of individual little curly projects in all over the country, really, right across the UK. And some of them are, are NGO led, like RSPB projects, but some of them are not. And, and in fact, majority are not. Majority are just local bird watchers or farmers or something saying, actually, let's let's save these things. And so there's a whole variety of little projects starting up. There's some serious money going in. The RSPB has been given a big EU grant. To, to, to look at curlew in the uplands. And um, four months ago, after a whole series of big meetings uh, about curlews across, across the UK, including two held by Prince Charles, who loves curlews, by the way, um, we now have something called the Curlew Recovery Partnership England, which is a round table of major NGOs, of which I'm chair, um, and we have a partnership manager called Russell Wynne, and we're coordinating or helping to coordinate a lot of these projects, help give advice, try and find funding. So there is action on the ground. But, you know, it, it's starting, it's got legs, it's kind of just about off the starting line, but there's an awful, awful long way to go. And in countries like Wales and Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland, um, we do need a more coordinated vision. Yeah. Yeah. And if if someone who listens to that and is terrified, um, how they can get involved, how, how, yeah. how they can help? Please come on board. And if you go to the Curly Recovery Partnership England website, and it's just called curlyrecovery.org, and then there's a, a link there you can just sign up and um, you get the newsletter and you'll get information on what's happening. And if you're in an area that needs volunteers or needs some help or whatever, a whole range of things. Um, then please do. But, you know, there will be something happening around. And if you live in a city, I mean, I don't live near Curly Projects. I live in the middle of Bristol. Um, but you can do talks. You can talk to people. You can raise some money for Curly Projects. There's all sorts of things that you can do to get involved. But really being aware and talking and spreading the word is as important as anything. It, yeah. It's so important. We fall in love with them again and want to see them. Yeah. Yeah. And and overall, uh, curlew uh, in the world, how how is it is it in other um, places a similar dire situation, or are there anywhere pockets where they're doing okay? In in the UK, sorry, or across? No, in general, like in general, species about the, talk about species. Um, the Eurasian curlew is right across Europe, so it goes from the west of Ireland right the way through to the east of Russia. Really. Um, and I think it'd be true to say that there are places in these more remote landscapes where I'm sure they're, they're still nesting and, and doing all right, but we don't necessarily know because they're very hard landscapes to, to study. There's an indication <clears throat> that in Europe, the one country where they do seem to be hung, hanging on quite well is Finland. But it, apart from that, I think it's a pretty declining picture, to hmm. be honest. I think there's farming and the intensification of farming is Europe wide. So wherever that has happened, wherever there's massive machinery, lots of disturbance, cutting for silage and the associated high numbers of predators right across the board, we're seeing problems. So Europe is seeing a steady decline as well. 
And we're seeing that reflected in every in all the data sets coming out of countries. But you know, Finland is is bucking the trend, and we're hoping that some of these more remote parts of step areas will as well. Mm-hmm. And and do you know are they genetically similar or is it the like same species? Yeah, same species. Mm-hmm. Because I know that there's always uh, someone comes out. It's like, oh no no no, this is like a Finland subspecies, and this is not exactly so. Well, not as far as I know. It's okay, okay. <laughs> and in fact, there's masses exchange between Europe. I mean, we know Polish birds come to Britain. We know that. Oh, that was my next question. So yeah. they do migrate. They absolutely do migrate. Um, they vary in the migration. They're not like, uh, you can't say, oh, the, that curlew is, will definitely go to Poland to breed or something. Yeah. You know, they're, they're kind of really complicated, but we do know that a lot of European birds spend the winter in Britain. We have soft, wet, mushy, invertebrate rich coastlines, you know, which are nice and sort of mild compared to a lot of Europe. So we get loads and loads of curlews around our coast in the winter. And then they will disperse back into Europe um, come the spring and summer. And so there's this great, you know, curlews don't mind whether it's Europe or Britain. I mean, there's this great movement across Europe of the birds. Um, and so uh, it's, it's wrong to think of our curlews. Our curlews are also Finland's curlews, are also Poland's curlews, are also France's curlews, you know. Gotcha, gotcha. So that I, I guess that's, Maybe that's a question. Do you think it's that's a that's a good for overall uh, forecast for the species, or 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 the opposite? Because even no. if they're doing great somewhere else, then they're gonna come back to the place where they're not doing so great and get hammered there. So I'm not sure whether it's good or bad. Well, I think there's um there's a general feeling um, across Europe that these are special birds. All birds are special, but they have this these qualities that people can hold on to that make them. Uh, appeal to a wider you know public and so I think there is a, a sense that the curlew is something that is a flagship species for many countries so there is a, a desire to work together to protect them and, and in fact that was shown in France uh, where there was right up until a couple of years ago winter shooting of curlews on the coast so hunters would shoot uh, roosting waders in the winter uh, including curlews and um And there was a big outcry and it was stopped and it has been stopped now for two years. So it is illegal now to shoot, shoot curlews in France in the winter. How long that will hold on, we don't know. But at the moment, um, that's the situation and it, it hasn't been changed. So that shows that we're working together. They were using data from different countries and saying this just isn't acceptable. You know, mm-hmm. that's, a, that's actually good news. How it do you see the future? How do you see the future? How do you how do you? see you know curlew situation let's say played out over the next five years decade it's a really hard question to answer honestly to be honest for me mm-hmm. i mean hand on heart best case you... best case scenario right okay. we know we, we know what's worst case scenario but best case scenario best case scenario is that that we the island manages to hang on to them that's the best case scenario not convinced they will but um they might it might have gone beyond the tipping point in ireland but let's be optimistic and say with concerted effort head starting with all sorts of techniques they might be able to hold on to them i think we'll lose them in a few more areas of england but we will turn them around in others and then hopefully they might recolonize back again So 10 years time, I am hoping that we will see we will see greater nesting and fledging success. I'm hoping we will. And I, and I think there's no reason why we shouldn't if, if the commitment stays the same as it is at the moment. So yes, I, I am. I mean, I, why, why would I do what I do if I didn't think that? So mm. I'm, I'm, I am hoping. Yeah, I, I know, very good. I, I noticed that it is in, in general there's this optimism right it will be hard to find the energy if if you know someone said like, ah it's as good as done i'm not going to bother so it's, no no it's, we it's, can't it's have that attitude yeah <laughs> it's, and it's great to hear that these are that the things are moving in the in the right direction um mary for 
you know, we're going to be wrapping this up, but in general, just, just to, just to summarize in general, how do you, it's a similar question as the previous one, but any broader, how do you see our um, relation with nature evolve in the future? How do you see this happening? Do you see, do you think that the, some visible trends of stuff changing and people being more aware will continue on that? Or do you think that we are in the real um, possibility of scenario of like, here's wildlife on this piece, fence of peace and all the rest is the kind of like a city-like uh, concrete thing with electric cars of course but still you know like how how do you how do you see this plays out over for future generations let's say well the optimistic side of me thinks that um that we are seeing a, a real ch- a, a sea change in people's attitude to the natural world and to the environment i think that, you know the real concerns about climate change are coming through uh, politically and at a, a local level um, and we've got the big cops coming up and you know governments are seriously saying no we've got to do something about this so there's a general raising of awareness that the natural world and what we do to it is actually important the same for biodiversity loss we've got the biodiversity cop 15 coming up uh, which will highlight that again so i think there is a general increase in awareness compared to 10 years ago people talk about the natural world in a way they never did before. I think that's a really good thing. The thing is, is to not get negative about it, is to garner that interest and that energy for positive change. I think COVID has, with all the devastation that it produced, did undeniably make people appreciate the natural world a bit more. You know, we've heard this everywhere, haven't we? At last I noticed the birds and bees in my garden, you know. So we are beginning, there's a sort of confluence of influences coming together, which is helping society to to realise that nature is important. And then we've got to keep that momentum going. So if we do get a GCSE in natural history, for example, then that will start to feed into the education system an increased awareness in younger people. And you'll just generally, hopefully start to see an uplift. Uh, and I, that's what I'm hoping. That's the vision that I've got, that we will do it, that we will care enough to do it. But we have to see leadership and we have to take everybody with us. The poor and the rich have to go with it. This can't just be a hobby for people who can afford to buy rich food in posh shops. This has to be something that everybody buys into because it's life enhancing and it's good for you. And we all benefit from. If it becomes a political football, if it becomes just a constant shouting match, you know, we will fail every step of the way. But it doesn't have to be like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mary, listen, um, thank you for that. I really appreciate your time. Uh, and folks, uh, Beak, Tooth and Claw, Living with Predators in Britain, uh, available uh, in every bookshop and, and online and everywhere. So um, I encourage everybody to buy that book, read it, and uh, digest everything. Mary, thanks again. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Tommy. It's an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thanks.